Well, hey everybody, and welcome back to the Slice, and welcome back to our Wimbledon 21, 2021 coverage presented by Rally Tennis. We have an extremely special guest today, the legendary Chris Fowler of ESPN, longtime journalist, broadcaster, uh, aficionado. Chris, thanks for coming on the Slice, and welcome to the show. Uh, it's an overly kind intro, Stephen. Thanks, I appreciate. It. Looking forward to. It. I got nothing else to do here on Middle Sunday in quarantine, so uh, I love talking tennis with people that have passion for it. So. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, yeah, it is. It is. It, I'm calling this the Middle Sunday Special with Chris Fowler, the first and the last, because as you all know, uh, Middle Sunday is no longer to be, and that's that's just how it goes. So, obviously, most people that are watching this already know you, Chris. But I just wanted to give a little anecdote of of my experience with you. It's it's funny as a tennis fan. We're both tennis fans, but you're obviously a full time broadcaster in the sport, and so we've watched. I feel like I've watched so many legendary matches with you over the years as you're kind of conveying the story of it to me. My favorite one I got to point out is, is Djokovic, or sorry, Nadal versus Federer Australian Open 2017 final. Uh, I think it was you, John, Patrick, and, and Darren in there. Um, and it was just epic. Obviously, such a great match. I'm a big Federer guy. Everyone on the channel knows that. Um, I, I had so, a feeling you were. But if you picked that match, I had a feeling you were a Federer fan. <laughs> fair enough. That would be weird to pick if I was a Djokovic fan. But um, yeah, you got one quote in there. Um, and it was, in the quote, it was in the fifth set. And it was just when, that, when the match was really getting to the peak, it seemed, of tennis history. Just both guys playing pretty good and comeback happening. Uh, and you said, we are all really fortunate to be seeing this right now. You can tell grandkids about this one. And I don't know, it's, it's funny, uh, as you know, you're a pro, I'm a junior in the broadcasting, everything you kind of says with the voice, it just, everything comes out as like a one-liner that can just be like written down, it seems like. So anyways, thanks you know, again. sometimes you, you do this as a job, but you're really a fan also. I mean, you wouldn't be doing this if you weren't passionate about it. I don't think a sport can be broadcast, you know, properly unless you have a, a real passion for it. So fortunately I, I do from a really young age for tennis. And sometimes you do in this match and you, you got to just step outside and not describe the point of the situation, but just say what everybody watching is thinking. And yeah. that's just, damn, are we lucky to be seeing this right now? This is a little slice pun intended of tennis history because, um, these guys are, are just that great. And, and we're so lucky to have so many matches where you feel that. That's yeah. an example. Um, Patrick had the best line about that match. He's just, he said that he beat uh, Nadal in a street fight. He beat Rafa at his own game. Roger did. Eh? You know, yeah. it wasn't pretty. It wasn't elegant. It wasn't stylish. The things that he's known for, it was just gritty. Yeah. Balls, you know, he come to come from behind and, and wrestle that away from Rafa. Uh, you could see in Rogers' reaction and that after winning that match with that, like the delayed reaction on the challenge, what it meant to him. And yeah. I can't tell you, you know, I, I, I grew up listening to Dick Enberg do matches from the same place I get to broadcast them. So many others over the years, you know, past summer, I'll call in the U.S. Opens. And that was a treat as a, as a young fan. But right now, to be able to have this job, in the era of those three guys of Serena and then now watch sort of the transition where the younger generation is trying to kick in the door. I'd throw Murray in there too, because um, one of the favorite matches I've ever called was Andy breaking through and winning his first Wimbledon here against Djokovic in the final, just yeah. because of the sheer tension in the court and in the country. Yeah. So to have this job in this era, I cannot tell you, how grateful I am and how fortunate I feel, um, you know, to, to have been a part of it. And hopefully you got quite a few more years and we'll see where it's going, but we, you know, none of us were ever going to take for granted what we've been able to enjoy the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And I, I get that from you guys. It's so cool to see all you guys, you know, ex players like John and Patrick and Darren uh, really relishing how special it is to, and just how fun it must be to be able to, wake up and go to your job every day when you get to go watch the best tennis players in the world courtside. So folks, so what our plan for this show is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about uh, Chris's situation where he's at a little behind the scenes of Wimbledon. It's a very, very, I would say unique 
situation that you're in right now. Um, and then we're going to get some insights into the first week of Wimbledon. We're going to get some predictions for uh, Manic Monday and the rest of the tournament. So stay tuned for that watch to the end. And I'm going to get some tips from Chris on how to make a proper cocktail at the very end. So make sure to stay tuned for that. And this is a nightcap. If you follow Chris on social media, um, if you don't, do it because he get, does nightly or nightcap recaps, he calls them. So I'm drinking a West Coast Pale Ale right now on the... Uh, on camera with you, and that's because I'm on the west coast gonna, of Canada. Uh, a Chianti Classico, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll toast you all the way over in Western Canada. Fair enough, that's good. I got it in my Bagel Time mug. It's kind of you know Bagel Time is the motto we like the motto we like to tell ourselves when we're going on court here on the channel. But yeah, um, so obviously your guys' coverage has been great. Uh, ESPN is always great. The, it seems like you guys always have so much fun in the booth. How's the camaraderie on your team, and what's it you know what's the vibe kind of like there? Uh, this year and as always yeah it's a big team it's a deep team i've been playing without me for a few days here but the affection for each other is really genuine it's hard to fake that it's hard to create the chemistry where it doesn't naturally happen the the mix of tennis personalities is so interesting to me coming from mostly a team sports background and working in football games with ex-football players the mindset is so different when you work with ex-tennis players but the blend of personalities you know from chrissy and mary joe and pam and then you've got, as you mentioned, John and Patrick and Darren and Brad and Jason Goodall and Cliff Drysdale and, and so many others um, over the years. It, it's so cool to be able to call two matches a day with two different commentators, two different styles. So my role gets to change to adapt to what brings out the best in them. And, you know, we, we try to hang out as much as we can, but it, it's important also to get your rest. But there have been some good memories, man. I'll, I'll tell you this, I, because we're sitting here on Middle Sunday. I, I was thinking today, 10 years ago, we were all at Dick Enberg's house for a Middle Sunday barbecue. And he, he was my mentor. He's the guy that I grew up listening. He, he first sparked my passion for Wimbledon. And Dick used to have a cookout for the whole crew. And he made these burgers, and burgers. And we all used to go over to his backyard on Middle Sunday. He and Drysdale would share a house. At one point, me and Brad Gilbert shared a house with Enberg and Drysdale. That was That's like a reality show that should have been made. Yeah. And, and so, you know, th those are just amazing moments. And, you know, Dick would cook the burgers up, tell stories, and he put baked beans in the burger, which wouldn't have been my choice, but you don't dare insult the legend if he wants to make it that way. You eat yeah. the damn beans in the burger, and that's the way it goes. But those kind of moments and those kind of memories are as much a part of it for me, or almost as much a part of it, as the memories of calling the matches. We're here to do a job, and it's really about the players and their stories and, and the history that they write. But the, the off-screen time that you have with the tennis team, Stephen, is really, like, priceless, too. So I, 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 I cherish that. That's awesome. And you guys communicate that. And uh, the off-court chemistry is, uh, is very apparent on your guys' on-screen product there. One, one thing before we get moving, I don't know if you remember this, but I ran up to you and Brad Gilbert at – you probably don't remember this, at Indian Wells 2018. And I just kind of had the camera here. I was when I was first starting out, I, I didn't know the etiquette. I was like, hey, Brad, and, and you guys nicely saw me. I remember that. It was, was right at the bottom of the stairs on the gate to the stadium. I remember that. that right? That's right. And I was, I was totally had a brain fart. I was like, I knew Brad because I, I kind of just knew a bit more of him. And I was like, I knew your name was Chris, but I, in, in the moment, I didn't know if it was Chris Fowler or McKendry. So I was like, oh, come on, Brad Gilbert there's and there's not, there's not much of a resemblance there. I know. And I guess, anyways, that was funny. Um, uh, so, but anyways, you, sir, are in a very unique situation right now. Give our, if, if our listeners here or watchers don't know, what's your situation right now? Why do you have time to come on the slice? <laughs> and what are you doing? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick about it. I, I think you'd rather hear about players than me. But, you know, listen, we knew the rules coming in. UK government has some different ideas about what to do with this. They're a little bit behind us. So you know that you've got to come in, sit here for five days. All you can do is go to, go to work and come back to your house. We all stay in these rented houses um, not far from the courts, which is a cool situation. And you go back and forth. At the end of that, I just got out of that five-day thing. I get an email while I'm in the bunker in Center for Calling a Match from the NHS, the National Health Services. You don't want to get those emails. No. I, I, as soon as I opened it, and they know you've opened it, you are committed to following through with this process. Someone on my flight, like a week before, from New York, tested positive once they got here, which according to their policy, even if you're fully vaxxed for three months, even if you've taken two negative tests since you've been here, you are out. 
for 10 days. So me and everybody else on the plane, by the way, having their vacations ruined. So I, I get credit for time served. So it's 10 days from the flight. So Tuesday, I can come back. But in the meantime, and I, you know, I can't leave the house. I can go out in the backyard here, but you're not supposed to venture anywhere. And so it's a bummer to, to know that the world's greatest tournament is going on a quarter mile from here and you're stretching your team thin and you're not able to do it. I'm, I'm, my, my sanity, you know, so far it's holding, but I will tell you that Manic Monday will be the hardest day for me because it's the busiest day for our crew. We go double barrel on both networks. And I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I've, I've always loved that day. And it's the last time, as you said, they're changing that tradition. So uh, I might feel a little blue. Um, I might start day drinking on Manic Monday to get through it because it's going to be a little bit rough. But, but hey, you know, it, it's, it, there are far, far worse things to endure than staying in this house and, and, and hanging out. But I'll, I'll be back Tuesday and be able to call the last three rounds. That, that's good to hear. And yeah, no, well, I've listened to your podcast and your social media and you talk a lot about self-betterment, uh, mental strength, you know, and, and, and a lot of that type of stuff. And it's props to you for being able to handle this because it'd obviously be a massive disappointment. And uh, it's just, yeah, I think you've handled it perfectly. Well, I think that what's, what's interesting about I do, I, I, I preach it and I practice it, but I'm also 58, you know? So it's interesting to me to watch the tennis players who are, you know, a third of that age, some of them, and, and watch them try to come to terms with the stuff that us older folk learn over time right which is worry about only what you can control and i can't control this and what the universe deals up i deal with it with acceptance now what you can control fight like hell and change it yeah and that's what needs to happen on the court for a lot of players too yeah. but when, when something's happened it's over and done with it's in the past turn the page move on i believe in you know short-term memory loss and all that stuff so those are lessons that come in handy. I meditate in here. I work out as much as I can, but um, the mental part of it, I would not have handled this. When I was your age, dude, I would not have handled it this well, or yeah. even, even like 10 years ago. I don't, I don't think, I think I'd be, I would have let all those feelings about, you know, anger and bitterness and frustration. And this is a crazy effing rule for someone that's been vaccinated and poses no threat to anybody. Yeah. But now I'm just able to sort of like breathe through it, yeah. watch it on TV and then get back to work. So no, well, yeah, well, massive props to you. And, uh, I'm glad you're going to be able to get back in the, back in the sack for Tuesday and the rest of the tournament, the business end, which we're going to get to soon, but I don't know, you know, a lot of, most Americans know you from college football, um, obviously. I, and, but you know, I know you from the tennis, like I said before. So what, what's your background in the sport of tennis? Did you play? Um, and when did you kind of start covering it, uh, full time? Uh, I'm 11 years old when Jimmy Connors and Christy ever win Wimbledon here in 74. And I started to really pay attention to it. You got two American stars, um, really appreciated both of them as players. You get caught up in the whole show business of it. And uh, that's why I fell in love with Wimbledon and, and really at, at tennis at that age. I, I didn't have a hell of a lot of talent. I did play, I played it all the time, played up through high school, but was never going to play beyond that. Didn't start early enough, didn't have parents who pushed and probably didn't have enough talent. But certainly as a, I, I played it plenty as an adult in, in and around surgeries and rehabs, I still love to play. So, you know, I've been a tennis fan as long as I've been a football fan. And, and I've ended up, you know, calling matches here since 2003. So I've called many, many times the number of tennis matches to football games. But football being visible and being the biggest sport in America, in college game day, I did that for 25 years, and that was a something I'm super proud of doing. Yeah. But tennis is my co-favorite sport to football. It doesn't take a backseat at all. Wimbledon and the Rose Bowl, I always say they're my co-favorite events. So, you know, it, it's it was funny to me when, oh, the football guy, you're not bad at tennis. You kind of get in the hang of it. Well, okay, thanks. That's a backhanded compliment. I've loved the sport since I'm 11 years old. But, you know, whatever. If you, you want to see me as a football guy? I mean, plenty of people have crossed into tennis from other sports. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a viewer like you, mixed success, mixed success with that. Yeah. But um, I hope at this point, Jesus Christ, that they can tell I, I'm not an interloper here, that I, I, I love this sport. And man, there's nowhere else I'd rather be uh, when all of the, four of the Grand Sims are going and then right there. So. Fair enough. Well, I, I, in my mind, yeah, you're just uh, Chris Fowler, the, the, the pro guy 
tennis commentator who is, uh, t- I always love your guys' uh, mix with, you know, kind of wrangling Johnny Mack as he's going off. And I felt like you were always like the really, the really pro guy in there um, telling the story, which is super cool. So let's get into the story. What do you think were the biggest stories or kind of standouts from uh, week one at Wimbledon here? Well, unfortunately, it, it's, it's Serena slipping and sliding out. I mean, that, that was the biggest story in terms of ranking of news impact. And, and something that was so sad to see, you know, and there's extra layers of emotion on there because she is 39 and because every year, you know, the clock is ticking against her and, you know, father time always wins. Yeah. And you just hope that that's not the last you've seen of her. This was, you know, a great chance for her to make it. She remember she made the final the last four years she's played here. So she's always a contender here. Um, and I would have loved to see her make, a deep run. So that, that's a massive story that she went out quickly. Obviously the story before the tournament on the women's side, Osaka not being here, Simona having to pull out. I mean, the absences on the women's side began to be a big thing. And then obviously, you know, it, you know, Rafa not being here, it, it's all eyes on, on Novak and Roger, but I think there's many, many more stories that have emerged. Th- those guys are still around and they're still right there uh, at the top of the favorites list, but we've had the emergence of players I knew coming in that Coco Golf, especially for American fans, yeah. was going to be a huge story. But the British also embrace her, and the British can spot what everybody else can spot. She's a star. Yeah, she's getting on center court in every match, and she's going to be probably be back there um, when she plays Kerber yep. on Monday. So, yeah, I mean, Coco is capable of winning it this year. I think so. And at seventeen, Kerber will be very tricky, but I, I think. With every match, she gets more comfortable. The pressure doesn't come from people like me or the newspaper. She's pretty good at dealing with that. The pressure comes from her own, her own mindset right. and balancing being hungry and impatient, wanting to do now with also taking it one at a time because there's no one in this row that she can't be if she doesn't get in her own head. So I think that you know, if, if she can keep progressing, that, that Coco will be can be for Americans and North Americans, maybe the biggest story on the women's side for sure. And I, we're all just um, so eager to see if she can clear the hurdle of beating the woman who won the championship here three years ago. You know, Angie's up and down all over the place. You never know quite what you're going to get set to set with her, yeah. right? But, I mean, she's still uh, uh, an imposing figure out there on the grass. And when she she's in, she's in a lot of trouble. So... You will see, but I mean, I'm hoping that Coco emerges as, as a massive story because I mean, you've talked a lot about it. 2020, 19, that is the, that is the backdrop coming in. That is the overarching story uh, on the men's side is, is can Novak level it up at 20 apiece here? Yeah. No, that, you're so right about Coco. And I feel like there's, you know, she's, we talked about forever. Like she's like why, calm and wise beyond her years, but you know, she's still a kid with that, with that youthful energy out in the court, which we love. And yeah, I think I think she's got a good chance. I was just looking at her section of the draw there, um, and it's to me it's gettable for her. Yeah, like you said, she can beat anyone in the draw. I also have loved the story. Of she can also, it's also Steve, she can also lose anyone in the draw. Yeah. Okay. And that that's the thing about Coco. You know, uh, she there there were some holes in her game. It wasn't just pressure and expectation. She she needed to clean up the forehand. The second serve is shaky. She controls the doubles. She's been serving beautifully. I mean, she's hard to break. If she just doesn't break herself, really hard to break right now. Yeah. And so I and I think that she's been solid on the forehand. And but it's really, it's really a lot about her. And I remember watching when Sharapova broke through and and won at, as a teen and beat Serena and, and and sort of figuring out like I, I told Maria early in the tournament, we had her come in a lot to, to the set for interviews. I said, you, you can win this. You can win this this yeah. year. And I would say, and you know, I not that I'm like some you know, Nostradamus, but I, she was so capable of doing it. And, and so is Coco. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. It's, and, and it's, and it seems now with the women's side of the things, it's always more open, right. Than then, you know, the men's we're all, we kind of know who's going to be at the end of the tournament every time it's, it's always more gettable. I think for most players in the draw, we saw that obviously at the French. Well, especially Open. now, I mean, yeah. you, you, you look at, you look at party and, and she, she's number one and she deserves it, but she doesn't win matches like a lot of number one players have won matches, right? She wins in three sets. She has yeah. peaks and balance. She's had them at tournament at matches at this tournament, you know? And so there, the door is always open. 
She, yeah. she can be taken. It's not like there's a dominant number one lurking around or waiting or having, and, and she also hasn't made a big push before at Wimbledon either. So, um, you know, that, that's why I say there, there's really no one out there when you, when, when Coco would walk on the court that you'd say, Hey, she's a serious underdog. I don't like her chances here. That's just not true. No, that's fair enough. And, uh, I, for good reason, I can see the Americans getting very stoked about, about their, you know, their brightest star. On the men's side, uh, Sebastian Corda is obviously another rising American star. Uh, I, I kind of put him in the same league now as, as you know, our Canadian stars, who on the men's side, I think the Canadians have been getting the better of you guys for a little while here, um, which is a first in a lot of things. That's for but, sure. Uh, um, Sebastian Corda, I put him right in that league now with, with um, Shapovalov and FAA as like, you know, some of the brightest stars in the men's game for the future. How do you like his chances going forward? Um, just looking at his draw, you know, he's got Hatchinov. Well, next, if, which... if, if Shapo and uh, Shapo and uh, Corda can win, of course, they play. That, that would be a quarterfinal matchup that would be very cool for American and Canadian fans. And um, I know they, they played at the Open. It's a pretty tight four-setter, if I'm, I'm going off memory, but I think it's a very close match. And, you know, Corda's developed a lot since then. You know, he, I saw... I saw Seve at the Australian Open. He was a junior. And, you know, I word got out, hey, there's this American kid. It's Peter Corda's kid. I go, oh, wow. I remember Corda, of course. Yeah. I, I called the Corda's matches. And so I go out and I, I watch his match. I hang around. So I want to have a word with him. And, and I just wanted to say hello, get to know him. We were looking at each other in the eye at that point. Okay. Yeah. Now we've shot up to 6'5". Yeah. I'm, I'm about 6'1". He, he's a late bloomer. So BG and I were talking about this. Anybody that follows basketball, um, he hasn't quite grown into playing big man tennis yet. He will, I think, get stronger. He'll get a bigger serve. But he's kind of like a 6'1 guard who can handle the ball and shoot really well and still has those skills, but they get to 6'5 now. You know, and, and he, he will serve bigger, but, man, is his game clean. There's no glaring hole in it at all. And his mentality... Mm-hmm. His his hunger, his professionalism, his swag mm-hmm. is is far better than the the other American players of his generation. And I I would say we've been lacking that in U.S. tennis for a while on the men's side. So I'm very impressed. Listen, Andre Agassi works with Corda. Okay, doesn't get paid for it, but invests his time and energy. Andre's not wasting his time and energy on a guy he doesn't believe in. And if Andre Agassi believes in him, I believe in him. He believes he's got the goods and the game. He can hit the ball much bigger than you typically see. He's, he'll begin to let it fly and, and play more of a power game. And, and I really think, I mean, you know, this isn't just because he's won a couple rounds here. Um, I really think that he turns, turns 21 on Monday when he plays Hatchinoff. Yeah. Um, I think he should beat Hatchinoff, although Hatchinoff is starting to play a little bit more like he – he used to play and he's showing rock solid against Tiapa who disappointed me, but that court is right there with that match. Get through that. I hope Shap will beat RBA. I think it'd be a nice match to have two young guys play for a yeah. spot in the freaking semifinals. I mean, then it would be a serious test of nerves. Dennis would have pressure on him in that match. Yeah. And we'd see how he handles it. So yeah. I, Corda, I'm glad you brought him up, Steve, because, I mean, he, he is as exciting to me. You know, being an American, obviously, we're starved for a guy who's got the combination of athleticism, and he moves really well for 6'5", game and mindset. And I think that I think that Corda has all of them. Um, I don't know what his upside is. I'm not smart enough to, to look and say, hey, he can beat top five. He can win slams. But I'm hopeful, and I, I, I certainly like what I see. And I think that, you know, hopefully you have, he'll have an attitude like, you know what, I'm not going to be patient. Yeah. I, I want it right now, and I'm capable right now of doing it. And if, I think if he has that attitude, I mean, Dennis has a little more firepower right now in terms of how he uses it, but he's more volatile. Yeah. Sebastian's very steady, I think. Yeah. So at least he has been. And maybe he wouldn't be in a Wimbledon quarter, but that match would be very open for the right to play Novak in the semis. That'd be a lot of fun. If, we, if we're sitting here in a week uh, talking about that, that'd be pretty cool. That would be very cool. And yeah, Sebastian is a cool customer. I talked with him back at the Delray Beach Open, which he did very well at at the beginning of the year. And I just speaking to him, I was like, this, this kid's even you know seven years younger than I am, and I feel pretty young. 
and he's just got that. You can tell that his, you know, he comes from a family with pro athletes, and uh, yeah, Sebastian's got he's got that killer instinct. I think he has he has easy power. He doesn't look like he takes as big of cuts at the ball as Shapovalov, but I bet you if you were on the receiving end of those shots, they'd be pretty similar in power, um, and that's a good thing because I, he can obviously ramp that up as he, like you said, grows in to his body. Yeah, going for going forward now. I feel like on on this tournament. There's been a lot of storylines with slipping, people pulling out kind of injuries. It's been almost like a, a calm tournament so far. I feel like there hasn't been any really epic matches that have kind of taken that tournament up into the next level where it's like, wow, this is really getting... But usually it happens in the second half of the week. Um, if we're going to look forward now into Manic Monday and the rest of the tournament, you know, I got, I got, the, I got the first day... Um, the schedule out here and I highlighted all the, the epic matchups and basically the entire sheet is highlighted. So there's just a lot of good <laughs> matches. It's like center court. It's Djokovic, Garin, Coco Goff, Kerber, Federer, Sonego. Uh, and then court one is, has some ridiculous matches for that. Like Barty, Kryakova, Felix, Ajayla, seems Zverev. you know, it's just, it's just star after star after star, which is why we love these majors, right? What, what do you, what stands out to you? I guess, I don't know if you have the schedule there in front of you, but what yeah, stands I got out it. to you? Um, well, I get the, I got the draw here. No, I mean, you talk about Felix. Now, you know, Felix and Zverev was interesting to me. I, Felix got a break. I mean, he didn't, he didn't look very good against Kyrgios. He looked very tight. Um, Kyrgios was serving, but then, you know, Nick shows up. He, as he says, he's a part-time player, and yeah. he, 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 can, he can play one set, and he hurts his ab, and then Felix gets a break, and he, he goes through. If Nick is right, I don't think Felix gets through that match, but, but – now he's got an opportunity. I, I swear to God, Stephen. I mean, I, I've saw, I've seen him since he's a kid too, and I've talked to him as a junior. He and Chapel were juniors when Milos made the final here. So I, I remember talking to those guys um, the day of the final. I was up on the roof here talking to these young Canadian guys who were both yeah, just like so pumped that Milos was there, and they were yeah. having success in the juniors at the time. And now here they are in, in the big show, but. You know, Felix, as every fan listening to this, no doubt knows, has struggled in finals. Um, when you haven't won a set in your fi- eight finals yet, um, that's a scary thing. And, and it, it's a big match with Zvera, but it's a winnable match. Uh, and I just want him to play. Now, it's not a final. So I, let, let's just play it like it's around a 16 match and bring your best and see if you can push Zvera and answer, make him answer some questions. You know, make him think Sasha's going to have the pressure on him in that match. Right. He's he's still got the serve that you don't know if you can trust uh, 100 percent of the time. He'll still serve 130 second serves. But but, you know, you could break down two and he's going to go to that match knowing that he's got FAA to play Berrettini or Ivashka. And really, you know, a court on Berrettini is tricky and that's going to be a bunch of tie breaks if they end up playing. Yeah. But, um, you know, to say the least it's a it's a challenge but but it's all there for him and i i'm, I'm so i'm interested in that if felix can post up i, I think it's interesting um Herkash and medvedev you know medvedev is becoming more and more convincing on the surface Herkash is tough um you know that that's sort of an open match i think yeah. you know roger has been a little bit up and down i mean you, you saw uh you saw the set against nori you know you know that Manorino gave him some trouble. Um, and Sanejo is, 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 is very capable of also taking a set. And, you know, Roger's going to have those days at, at almost 40 where, you know, he's going to, he's going to try to get through with the B minus game, yep. but his B minus game is way more vulnerable than Djokovic's B minus game. Right. I think we agree on that. Oh, no, yeah. Novak wins. Novak wins masters 1000s in third gear. Yeah, I, I've called many Masters events harder in a major to win 21 sets. So you're going to get tested. But yeah. but I've seen him beat good guy after good guy in those Masters draws with like the B minus game. Yeah. Never shifts out of third gear. I don't think Roger can get away with that now. I, I think I think that you know he's going to have to be sharp. Um, there are concerns the way he the forehand has gone awry at certain times um his focus has dipped a little bit his movement is better i think he showed up here after being undercooked not the typical run at hala and i thought i thought he was he wasn't falling down but he was kind of tiptoeing around the court right i think you'd agree in the first round and he didn't look comfortable hadn't done enough grass grass prep 
Well, he's going to, that's going to fit end for him. He's going to be much more comfortable on the court, I think in week two, yep. but he's got to, he's got to sharpen some things up. And um, if it's him and Medvedev in the quarters, which I frankly hope it is, um, that'd be a pretty compelling watch to see if, see if Medi, who, who doesn't um, profess to know much about grass or like it that much, yeah. but comes off a title in Mallorca is getting better. I think by the day on the surface and I mean, week two, it plays more like a hard court, as you know, where he's awesome. So I think that'd be a, a really fun quarterfinal to watch. Totally. I think it's super interesting what you said there. And it's totally true. Obviously with the difference between their, their B game, Djokovic and Federer now, you know, Federer back when he was 28 and he had a B game, he would, he would just physically outlast you and he could just step back and do that, which Djokovic yeah. does now. If Djokovic is having a B game, the opponent has to go and beat him still. He, he, Djokovic won't beat himself for you. Federer, his, when, he, when he's not playing well and he can't hit his forehand like we saw against Manorino, he can beat himself a little bit and then you can just be the steady guy. So it is much harder because, as you know, in the pressure moments, it's to win a tennis match, you have to hit the ball through the court and get it in the court, which is so hard. The other guy's not just, or when you're talking about Djokovic especially, he's not just going to give it to you. So Yeah, you know, the thing about Novak is too, why, why I think he's one of the most um, thoughtful, interesting athletes I've ever covered. Um, you know, I think Rafa is, is the, for me, the favorite athlete that, that I've ever covered just because his sheer grit and will, he was always the chaser of Roger, you know, for so many years when I first started coming on and the way he would adapt and try to improve his game. And, and the fact that, that he was, um, you know, all, always sort of the underdog in that matchup and, and what, what, you know, the resilience he's had to me, I mean, Rafa, is always going to be, and the charisma that he brings, Rafa and Roger will always sort of have a special place, but Novak to appreciate his game, his level of excellence, his quality, if you know tennis, it's pretty breathtaking. And I really believe, this has been said before by others, but I, I do believe this, and I have said it for a while, his toughest opponent is himself. You've got to disrupt the mind, body, spirit connection of Novak. If everything is in alignment, those three, I think is untouchable. I really do. Um, Roger on grass here can come close as he did, kept razor thin margin when Roger was playing extremely well in the final two years ago, but that's two years on since then. Yeah. Novak, Novak cannot have a full energy tank. There's no way the fuel is topped up after Paris with a two week turnaround. It's impossible. Yeah. But he's worked his way in. He hasn't burned a ton of energy yet. So you can build that back up. They, he will feel the pressure yeah. of 20. He will feel it. How it's expressed, I don't know. Can somebody exploit that when he gets tight? Remains to be seen. It's gonna, it takes a hell of a player to beat him, even when he's not right. But we've seen it over the years. And if, if Novak stays out of his own way, there's no doubt in my mind that, that he's, he's capable of having the greatest year anybody's ever had in men's tennis yeah. and pretty much wrestling away, at least on terms of numbers and, and data, that goat label for now. It's always a fluid thing. And yeah. Roth has always said this. Others say, wait till it's all said and done, then make that judgment between those three. There's still more to be written in this story. But if you want to do like the live, Goat rankings, if Novak wins here, wins in New York, I mean, on top of the all-time, weeks at number one, on top of the double career slam, maybe he gets a medal in uh, Tokyo. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? In a year? Yeah. Uh, so all of that is there for him, which, which fuels him, gives him hunger and motivation, but also creates pressure that he is not immune from. So it's going to be really interesting to see if he has one of those moments in the second week if a guy can hang with him and make him uncomfortable and, you know, is it green? Eh. Is it Rublev or Fucevic? Mm, doubt it. Yeah. Um, you know, who, who, who's it going to be in that side of the draw? Is it not until the final when he walks out on Sunday and there's somebody there who can trouble him by holding serve enough to keep scoreboard pressure on and get deep in sets where he has to think about it. He's been very human in tie breaks, as you know, this year. He was yeah. untouchable for a couple of years, including the breakers that he, he beat Roger two years ago. I mean, untouchable. Yeah. But he's not untouchable right now in breakers. 
Yeah. You know, we saw him play some shitty, excuse me, can I say that in your podcast, breakers in, uh, in Paris. He got, he got out of that. He overcame it. Yeah. He played a terrible breaker here. You know, and he lost, lost the first set of the tournament to uh, the Draper. To Draper. It's un- unbelievable. It um, is unbelievable. And, it, and it, so. it, it, it's like you can look at him and be like, it's so, he's been so dominant this year at the majors. But in reality, it's, it's, we've seen him be dominant a lot of other times where it's like there is no chance he's losing to anyone maybe other than Rafa. But it's like in reality, he's gotten down in so many matches in these tournaments where it's like he was on the brink of losing some of them and then he came back. So it's a different vibe, brink, but it though. shows that, more. That's the thing. He's on the brink, but then he talks himself back into it. Which shows the more Mazzetti great. match or the Mazzetti match or the, or the final with Sitsipas. I mean, he, 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 he finds a way. And that's why he's so damn hard to beat in these majors. I mean, he's hard to beat anywhere. But he's got so much ability to sort of regroup and reset. But you got to play at, at, at a red line level for more than two hours, right? More than two hours, probably, and hope he's at that B minus level to get the win. And that's been very, very hard to do. Yeah. Like when we saw Query, I was watching that match when Query beat him in 2016. I think he had over 60 aces. <laughs> aces. That's like. That's where Djokovic didn't even touch the ball. That's just, I don't see anyone doing that. No, this no, year. but that, that had a lot to do with Novak not being aligned mind, body, spirit. He was out of whack, as we know. And his personal life was, was very troubling at that time for him. And, but that, but 16 is the parallel because he came here in 16, halfway to the calendar slam, an Olympic year, rolling along. People were talking about the, the potential for the Grand Slam. Um, and, he, he came undone. Yeah. Now, the, I think here, um, small team, tight unit, not many distractions. Um, and he's been, he's been so businesslike. Yeah. Um, he's been scary. He's been pretty scary focused since the first set of the tournament. It's weird that nobody's won this title after lo- on the men's side after losing their first set. You know, this is a tennis trivia. You know the last time that happened? I heard it. You guys said it, but I don't remember. Sampras. Wow. Sampras and Knighty was the last time has been almost 20 years since somebody's lost their first set and gone on to win it. Um, it would not shock me if, if Novak wins 21 sets in a row after losing the first set. That wouldn't shock me at all. Would it shock you? No, not really. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. And, uh, you know, as a Federer guy, it, it is like, it's super interesting to, to hear you say that. And, and I agree. Like if Djokovic can go through this year, win the Golden Slam, it, on paper, he's got the best statistical career, which is crazy for me because I was like five, ten you years ago, though, I was always like, that's just never going to change. But so many things have blown gonna, my mind in the last you. few years. <laughs> yeah. I thought Federer okay. was never going to win another, another Slam in 2013. I thought he was going to retire. So... It's uh, it's very so. I think that's I, I'm getting your prediction is that Djokovic is probably going to be standing on Sunday as the victor. Well, I mean, it's uh, that's it means like odds on favor. I just think it's gonna he's gonna have to beat himself. But I'm not I, listen. I'm I'm in the no foregone conclusions camp, man. Uh, I, I don't ever take anything for granted in this sport. We've seen too many things happen where, where there's no substitutions. It's yeah. not next man up, right? Yeah. It's no one else there but but you. So I'm not giving him the trophy at all. But I, I think you, you look at the way the draw is. I mean, he came here knowing Rafa wasn't here. Okay, so that's a huge challenge. Not, not, not there. I mean, the match they played in 18, the semifinal, 10-8 in the fifth, under the roof. Yeah. I think Novak got saved by the delay, saved by the sleepover, and, and won that match. He, saved, he was just better in the big moments than Rafa, but it was this close. I mean, he knows if Nadal turns up here and can recharge his batteries – that's a serious threat. Yeah. Okay. So you take that out of the equation. Um, it, 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 it changes everything for him because the young guys that are knocking on the door haven't done it here yet. Yeah. I mean, know that. Yeah. I mean, Sisyphus, yeah. Medvedev, and, and Zverev haven't done it here yet. Yeah. And then they haven't really come close to doing it here yet. And Raonic isn't here. And Kyrgios is, is, is not a factor. So the, the, the number of guys who threaten him who can get him out of that comfort zone. You, you, he's not just going to melt down. You got to have some stress. You yeah. mentioned the query match. He was stressed by the serving you talked about. Yeah. He wasn't getting close to breaking Sam. Yeah. Anderson can stress the hell out of him. Not, not the other day, but like when Kevin was in his prime yeah. and had him on the ropes here, 
in the semi over on or the quarter over on court one that year. I mean, that kind of guy can stress him. So I don't see in this draw on his half anybody that's going to make him nudge him toward freaking out. <laughs> so yeah, I agree. But in the final, I'm not. But in the final, that's different. I agree. And I said that at the, in our draw preview, I said all of the guys who I think could, could hurt Djokovic are on the bottom half and he's on the top half, which is, uh, which is really good for him. We got a, we're running out of a little bit of time here, but um, so I got a question from one of our uh, Patreon supporters, Sean, who said, if, if it's not Djokovic versus Federer in the final this year, who, who do you think could be the other two guys that, that, could make it. I think it's pretty hard to pick someone other than the Djokovic on the top half. I mean, but... take, so take those guys out of it. So take those guys. Say they both lose in the fourth round somehow. Who do you think? Who do you think? Um, well, Ber- Berrettini is very capable. I mean, why can't Berrettini be considered? I, to me, he's like right there with as good a chance as anybody up in that half of the draw being there in the final anyway. Yeah, agreed. I agree. Your, your, your concern as, as a fan is it's Novak against somebody else that's like borderline pee in their pants when they walk out for the final on Sunday. You don't want that kind of a final. Right. You, you don't, on, honestly, you don't want Ando the other year. You don't want Chilich when he plays. You, you, you don't want a guy that's, you want, you'd like to have somebody like a Rogers standing there. Yeah. But, but I, from Novak's half of the draw, um, you know, it's so open. It's, it's just, it's just, and you're throwing it against the wall. I mean, I don't think Gareen beats him unless Novak gets hurt or something or something, something crazy happens. Um, so, I mean, you really got to use your imagination, but I mean, Chapel or Corda, I, I'd love to see them make the semis, but I don't, I don't even, it's hard to even speculate. Stephen, even right about him and then yeah. losing it because again, it's about him. So now you're trying to get inside his head and figure out what's going to make Novak not play like Novak. Right. Now, the combination of circumstance, opponent, an off day, he tweaks something. You're 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 just grabbing at stuff right now. That's how that's how solid and, and big a favor he is on that half of the draw. Yeah, and even if the crowd goes against him and or something like that happens, it seems to just make him play more ferocious and better somehow. That uh, it he can use that to help him. Um, but but but, but Berrettini, I'm I'm just going to say FAA is not in that mix. I hope to start to I hate to like. First Canadians bubble. <laughs> I, I think Berrettini, Zverev, or Medvedev. Yeah. If it's not Federer, none of those guys would shock me to be, right. to be standing Even, there on, on Sunday. I, I don't see Federer as a favorite coming to the bottom half right now. To be honest, that was just who do Sean's you see question. as a favorite? Who do you see in total, or just in the bottom Berrettini half? out of the, out of that half of the draw? I thought Berrettini before the tournament because I was super impressed with the way he played at the French against Djokovic. Um, I think Djokovic got saved a little bit there in the fourth set by that delay kicking all the crowd out. Berrettini was looking mean. And on the grass, I don't know. I don't know how you return Berrettini's serve. Like it's, to me, it's the biggest serve in the game right now. And it's, uh, and it's scary. And he moves and he really slices well because just to, like people think that you got to blast the ball by Djokovic. But I see him struggle more with guys who mix it up and provide variety and not a lot of pace because he can handle pace so well and use it against you. So I don't know. I think Berrettini has a nicer mix of that than somebody like Zverev. So I think I see him more as a, as a guy to get through on the bottom half, but I think that's yeah. smart. Yeah. 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 So anyways, that's, I think that for the men's side, that's a pretty good look here. We are running out of time just based on the capacity we have here. I wanted to get a little bit of uh, some just tips from you. So, uh, you know, we're making drinks, you know, the nightcap recap. From you. Okay, what, so, so my wife actually, she brought pre-shaken Pisco Sour. This is, my, mixed, this is the first podcast where the guy's got a cocktail shaker. I love it. You know, new media, right? We got to find different angles. Uh, we got Pisco. We got lime juice, um, simple syrup, and I'm forgetting something. But, yeah, it's all mixed in here. I've got a little glass. What what's uh if you're making a cocktail, what's a some just basic tips like no goes or about, like do, what do you gotta think but about? The, but the egg whites are part of that drink. Too. Oh yeah, I got egg white in here too. That's what I was missing. Yes, egg white. All right, just making sure. You <laughs> can't call it a pisco sour. No, I, I've been to Peru. I took a very cool train to I, I love Machu Picchu and I am a mountain climber, but I did not take the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. I took a very fancy train right. from Cusco up to Machu Picchu uh, and then then you know hiked all around it. But they were serving pisco sours in the train, and that that nice like foamy top. Because I'm sure you're gonna get that. You shake that up, you get the egg yeah. white in there. It pours out. It's just such a nice drink. I wish I had one. God, uh-huh. you're making me thirsty for a pisco sour. 
Um, uh, yeah, we didn't I, get this shake as uh, much with the egg foam, just uh, because we're I'm a rookie. That's why I need advice. But yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's, no, uh, no. it's very my nice. I heard it's, I, don't, I, don't, I really drink tequila just pretty much um, straight up now because I, I like nice tequila. Yeah. But um, but I've had some Wimbledon's here where Agassi. This is going to sound so like bad name dropping, but but Andre is a great mixologist, and Andre takes pride in his margarita, and my margarita recipe is a combination of, of Agassiz and McConaughey's. They both have some good ideas. Um, I think Andre puts, I think he puts a little orangina. I mean, obviously you got to figure out what do you put with the tequila and the lime? Are, are is it going to be um, triple sec, eh, Cointreau or Grand Marnier, more top shelf. And then a, to get that little carbonation, the a little orangina splash. So that when you shake it, it gets a little foamy, it's got a nice quality to it. Um, each of those guys do not, they don't make pitchers now. You don't, you don't make drinks like that in a pitcher. You make it individually. Right. So you got to be patient. It takes, it takes a long time, really for like, you know, McConaughey and I were speaking on, on a podcast. He was a guest and talking about, you know, how patient you have to be when he makes you a drink. Cause he's going to take his time, man. And it's part of the arts and crafts of it. Yeah. And so Andre used to be the same way. Our Andre was a very prideful bartender. And so it almost makes you thirsty for a margarita, but you know, I, I, you get older um, and you get more concerned about fitness and I just don't, I don't want the calories of that shit in there. So I, I just like plain tequila with a little, little fresh lime in it. Um, and, and sometimes if it's good enough tequila room temperature with nothing in it. Fair, fair enough. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's funny. It's a uh, it's it's a whole. Other, I did listen to that episode and you and Matthew McConaughey talking about that, and that's just, that's just super cool. So, Chris, where can where can our viewers find your podcast? Obviously, probably on most podcast networks. But what do you guys talk about? What are what are, what is the thirty second trailer for the? Yeah, like, what you got? It's, it's not a sports pod. It's about stuff that interests me. We we do some sports storytelling. You know, Charles Barkley's been on there. Uh, we have a lot more athletes coming on. Lance Armstrong will come on pretty soon, and these are people that I know. And so it's storytelling. And it, sports comes into it, but it's really just about stuff that's happened in their lives and other topics like that. So it's called Fowler, Who You Got. It's on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, all the usual platforms. We're in a hiatus now. Uh, we're coming back in August and, you know, just before the open and football season. So, yeah, we're having a lot of fun with it. You, you don't, we don't sell any ads on it. It's just kind of like a creative outlet. It's fun for me to do. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, I, I'd appreciate you listening. Yeah, of course. Uh, people, you know, everyone's going to follow that and check that out. And we're going to continue to love your guys' ESPN's broadcast of Wimbledon. Which, what's your first match back going to be? Do you know yet? Uh, I don't know Tuesday's schedule. Obviously, everybody plays on Monday. So, um, I mean, I, I can tell you that if a few players get through Monday, where I'm likely to, what I'm likely to do, it's going to be women's matches. Um, I, I sure hope Coco's there. Yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I think the, um, the women's quarterfinals, man, I mean, it just, it's just, it's so crazy. It's so open. It really is just like a lottery. Yeah. So sit back and, and, um, and, and enjoy the unpredictability of it all. That, that'll be Tuesday. And then obviously we got, we got men's quarters on, on Wednesday, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, of course. So if you had to pick winners for both sides, men's and women, who you got, Fowler? Well, I mean, should I, should I just go ahead and jinx her and say Coco, just because I'm hopeful I'm a little bit of a homer there? But I really do believe she can do it. I think Kerber is her danger match. And if, if you're listening on Monday and she's already lost, you're what an idiot to think she could win that. But, um, but you know, I, I'm going to say, I mean, Barty is a safer bet. But, um, but uh, it'd, be, it'd be, a, be a fun semifinal if those two play. I, I just can't. If you're asking for a serious opinion, I cannot pick against Djokovic. Yeah. So it's not very original. But... Neither are most people. I mean, I think every pundit, Stephen, every pundit on our team, get, making an honest prediction, picked him. Yeah, and now, I would. We might, we, we might be I'm underestimating. Sure. The, I'd be underestimating the toll Paris took in the short turnaround, and we just think of him as a machine. Yeah, but he's playing pretty machine-like right now. I don't know. It's just again, I'm using my imagination to think of anybody in that half who could beat him in the yeah. final. Of course, those guys we talked about. Of course, Roger can beat him. Yeah. on a day but um i mean he's so close two years ago but you see this cat behind you see that cat on the roof did you see that 
There was a yeah. cat crawling across that brick wall. Uh, yeah, I saw that. That's a, was that a black cat? I feel like that's uh, a. Like it was a black a, cat. I don't know if that's a bad omen. I mean, that might mean uh, I'm not getting out that, of this prison. That's here. very 2020 esque hey, with COVID and and your bad luck right bad now luck getting right stuck now. there. I don't know what that. That's that's pretty freaky. In the end of our interview, here comes a black cat, like right over my shoulder, walking along that wall. Oh man, that's <laughs> man, that's, that's that's too that's, much. We got to get out of here. We got to make sure you're set to come back Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> That's so good. Cheers, That's man. So good. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Well, let's do it again. I, hey, I would love to do it again. I really, really appreciate you coming on here, Chris. Uh, we, our, the Slice family, we're all thankful to you for that. So you got Djokovic winning and Coco Goff winning. I'm going to go with Federer winning. He's going to come back and right the wrong of 2019. And I think Ash Barty's winning because she's a bad woman. And she's just uh, she's, a, she's a gamer, and I like her on the grass. So anyways, thank you, Chris, so much. Uh, we will, we'll see you on the ESPN coverage, and hopefully we'll see you again here on The Slice sometime soon. Thanks, I had a great time. Be well. Well, that, folks, was the first ever and the last uh, Middle Sunday special nightcap recap with Chris Fowler. Huge shout-out to Chris for coming on to the show. Thank you guys for supporting The Slice and his podcast. Go check out. The links are all below for that. Uh, The Slice during Wimbledon 2021 is presented by Rally Tennis. It's the app where you can download it and you can find other players in your area. You can p- compete in leagues, p- compete in playoffs to like dominate your local tennis scene. There's also lots of other collaborations they have with Tennis Warehouse, etc. Ways to get discounts on gear. It's just so many things. It can be like the tennis center uh, for your life. Use the Rally app, download it below. Thanks for the, to Rally for being our supporting sponsor. Wimbledon week two is about to get going. If you're still watching this at this point in this video, thank you, you're a legend. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, and we will see you guys very soon again here on our channel.